Well, I think most of you know John. Just about everybody here knows John. Uh, climber, ski instructor, mountain guide, and uh, operator of manager of a big ski resort. He's had a remarkable career here in the Rocky Mountains and other places. Um, it's great to have him here telling his stories. And uh, yeah, as Elizabeth pointed out, this guy, Tex Vernon Wood, was his grandfather. So that was where John and I had decided we would start tonight. Tell us about your grandfather, John. Well, there we go. When people ask me when I came to Banff, I, I will answer obliquely and say, well, my grandfather moved here in 1906. <laughs> and <laughs> that fools them. But uh, no, <clears throat> Granddad was quite a character. He um, came from England. He, um, he spent uh, a couple of years or a year or so working on a farm in Ontario. He headed west and was in Medicine Hat for a couple of years and then and then came to Banff. And uh, the interesting thing was he had a pair of unique shafts called Texas shafts. And he became known to everybody as Tex because of, because of his shafts. But he was quite a character. He was a, uh, a guide and outfitter. And uh, he was a hunting guide. And until the late, late 20s, when they changed the boundaries of the park and, and uh, cut back on the, uh, on the hunting territory, so... Tex moved out, Tex and my grandmother Joan moved out to uh, the out Invermere area where he had a ranch. And so it was quite a life, and he was quite a character. He wrote stories um, for various magazines in New York, and they're, they are really interesting and always humorous. So yeah, he's a, uh, a good antecedent, that's for sure. Yeah, and now your, your grandfather's stories have actually been uh, preserved in a a volume. They have, yes. By uh, your brother or your cousin? Uh, that was my brother, I believe. Yeah. 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 Or nephew, one or the other. Some, anyway, <laughs> we've, our book club has read your grandfather's stories, and right. they're very interesting. Yeah. And, and now you told me, we, we sort of missed, uh, Tex was not his real name. No, no, it was, he was named after a friend of his mother, a, a woman friend, Nell someone, and his name was Nello, which he did not use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so when, he, when he came west, it was call me Tex. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And now Tex had four children? He did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your mother, Dorothy, and your Aunt Ruth, and two boys? And uh, no, one boy, there was uh, Olive, who spent most of her life down in New York, and uh, one son, Bill. Okay. Bill was the youngest. Yeah. And he was quite a character. Good yeah. man. Yeah. And, and your mom and aunt were outdoorsy girls. They grew up in the out of doors. Very much so. Yeah, they were the two that uh, loved the mountains. And, uh, and uh, for example, Ruth... Uh, was instrumental in helping Bernie and I with our camps, getting them going, and that sort of stuff. And right. she was really a character. Yeah, yeah. And and so, uh, Tex had a a ranch no, near Wilmer. That's right. Up on up on the bench, and uh, yeah. Yeah, he had that from the late twenties to nineteen forty six when my parents bought it. Yeah. And it was called the Horse Thief Ranch. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Beautiful ranch. Nice. Right. Nice. Uneconomic, but it was a <laughs> nice, <laughs> yeah. nice place to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, uh, now you grew up in Ottawa. How did how did Ottawa come into the picture? Oh, that was a tough one. My father was an officer in the army, and uh, he he had met. Uh, he went to Royal Military College, and uh, he was originally from Ottawa. But he went to Royal Military College, and when he graduated, there were no jobs in the military, and so he joined the RCMP and they sent him to Banff. And that's where he met uh, Dorothy, my mother, who was born and raised here. And uh, uh, when the war started, Second World War, Dad went immediately into the Army and served overseas. But when the war ended, he enjoyed Army life and he stayed in the Army. And the unfortunate thing was that at his rank, uh, 
they tended to put them at Army headquarters, which is where he spent a good part of his career, and so that stuck me in Ottawa. But yeah. the cross-country skiing was good. The cross-country skiing. <laughs> yeah. So you were born in 1947? 46. 46. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, oh I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. My goodness. And they've got it on tape. Yeah. yeah. So you were born in 1946 and grew up in Ottawa. Um, how, did you, uh, how did you get back to Banff here? Well, uh, first off, I spent a lot of time in the Columbia Valley. And I actually went to school in Invermere for a couple of years. And uh, we went out every summer. There was a major epic of my dear mother loading in four kids into a station wagon with dogs and a huge paraphernalia and drive across the country. And um, so I was quite familiar with, with the West. And Banff was always sort of the magic place. You know, mother was born and raised here and she always spoke fondly of it and we visited. And so uh, the earliest opportunity I had, I got out here. Yeah, yeah. Was, and, and when was that? When, when did you first sort of come west to sort of stay? Well, I spent a couple summers working uh, in the Columbia Valley, one on the railroad and uh, one on the uh, green chain of the logging camp up at the Bugaboos, long before Heli Scheme was there. And then... Uh, when I was, uh, I guess, 17, I finished high school, and um, I had a summer job at, uh, at Lake Louise working on the sedan lift and uh, lift operator. Yeah. And then I went back east, and <clears throat> Dad had moved down to um, a town in New York State with a nice college, and I went and started there. And I had been there a few weeks, and I got this really nice letter from someone called the Selective Services Commission, also known as the Draft Board. And Vietnam was just starting to ramp up. And uh, Dad came home from, from his office that day, and I said, uh, if you don't mind driving me to the airport, I'm out of here. And I, um, I phoned John Lehman, who was my boss at Lake Louise, and said, John, if I'm there in three days, do you have a job for me? And he said, certainly, get out here. And uh, so I uh, headed up and got the train and headed out to Lake Louise. The funny thing was, I always thought that that was a little thing between my dad and I, that he, he was a very proper guy, and I, I always thought that there was resentment that I had headed out. And about two years before he died, he, he and I were out walking somewhere, and he cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> do you remember that time that you were in Middletown and you decided to go west again? And I hair went up, and I said, yes. He said, I always told people that was the smartest thing I saw someone do. <laughs> so there we go. Yeah. So, so anyway, I got to Lake Louise, and uh, it was in the fall, and uh, working on things like raising counterweights with a Tier 4 and all that sort of stuff. And, and John Lehman was a good guy to work for, very dynamic. And uh, so I, um, I worked at, at Lake Louise, and then Franz Haas had the ski shops and, and ski school. And he offered me a job at, uh, at Temple Chalet in the ski shop, which I thought was pretty cool, and I took that. And um, after Christmas, there were days when there were 15, 16 skiers at Lake Louise. Like, we're, <laughs> seriously, like that. And so, so, um, so that was the end of my career at, Sun, uh, at Lake Louise. Franz laid me off. Yeah, yeah. But it led to a new career. Well, it did. A new phase. It did. I, I, uh, I got into Banff, and I went to uh, the uh, ski shop that was in the Book and Art Den. Remember the old frame Book and Art Den? And Bob Meggs ran the ski shop, and I went in and saw Bob, and he said, well, I hear that this is how small the town was. He said, I hear Sunshine's looking for a lift operator. <laughs> <laughs> so I got myself up to Sunshine, and, and uh, I... Uh, Met a fellow that seemed to be in charge by name Cliff White, and uh, and uh, his exact words were: I told him that I was looking for a job and what I had done, and he said, "Well, I'll give you a chance." So, a good. good chance it was. Good, it was. Well, we'll talk more about this, but we missed uh, we missed a, we skipped over a couple of stories um, <laughs> that, that are good and like we were prepared, um, and we didn't talk about. Um, when you first met Cliff and your trip into Assiniboine. 
Well, that's true. The, the, the summer that I, uh, that I was working at Lake Louise, um, Assiniboine was sort of a magic place in our family lore as well. And uh, my dear Aunt Ruth had worked there for quite a few years for Erling and Strom. So I thought I'd better get there. So I had two days off from the sedan lift, and I headed out to the highway and hitchhiked down. And in those days, you could hitchhike, and people would actually give you a ride. And I got a ride to the Healy Creek turnoff on the Trans-Canada, and I walked up from there up to Sunshine, and I got there. It was pitch dark, you know, it was black. I'm sort of... But I met a very kind man, and uh, he... Um, Put me up in the what was the old log was the hotel was the the log building that's still there, and said what time we we discussed what I was doing and he said well what time do you want to head out and I said well early and he said well the crew starts at five and I said perfect and so the next morning he fed me a really good breakfast and pointed me in the right way and that was my first dealings with Cliff White who became both my mentor and one of my dear friends right. and so I. I headed out across the meadows, and uh, it was beautiful weather, and I uh, went across the meadows through uh, Citadel Pass and down into the Valley of the Rocks, and I wasn't carrying much water. And I do remember when I saw Og Lake running down and sticking my head in the lake. It was, it was really dry. So then I, I got into Assiniboine, and that was my first visit to Assiniboine, and it was beautiful weather, and of course, it's the most spectacular spot. Yeah. And, and you met Erling. Yeah, I, I went into the, uh, I stopped by the uh, lodge and uh, Siri was in the kitchen and she very nicely made me a coffee and then I asked if there was a, it, did, it was starting to cloud over and I asked if there was a shed or anything I could put my sleeping bag in because I wasn't carrying a tent and Siri said, well, you'd have to ask Daddy, he's out in the, out in the workshop. So I went out and uh, now Erling ran a horse operation. You went in from... Uh, from here by horse pretty well, and he did not like hikers, but uh, he was civil, just, <laughs> and so we, you know, I, he wanted to know about how the trail was and stuff, and so then we uh, came to the point where I wanted to ask him about the, um, about the uh, little shelter, and I vividly remember him pointing down the lake and saying, the campground is halfway down the lake, I suggest you go there. <laughs> so that was a pretty good hint and so I, I was heading out the door and as I was going out I stopped and said oh by the way my aunt Ruth Satman asked me to say hello to you you are Ruth's nephew yes you go and see Siri I'll see you at dinner and we'll have a room for you <laughs> <laughs> so it pays to have the right people and that wasn't that was you know Ruth uh, and I were very close over the years and so anyway, that was my first yeah. visit to Assiniboine. And then I'd see Erling around town quite a bit, and we always got along well. Yeah. 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 Ruth, uh, Ruth was married to Jim Bagley uh, for a number of years, and she worked at Assiniboine um, and was a great skier, but she worked as a cook too. And her husband, Jim Bagley, was Erling's first wrangler. So very special yeah. to Erling. Yeah. Yeah, so a little diversion, but I thought that's we good. should Thank hear you. that story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a, and it was a wonderful trip, and it's one of the ones where I can just about remember every step going across those meadows, and, you know, it's vivid. Yeah. 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 I think we all remember our first. That's right. The first time we went to Assiniboine. Yeah. Good. So anyways, back to, uh, yeah, you've just headed up to uh, Sunshine. Mm -hmm. You've met Cliff, and you're going up there to be a lift operator. Yeah, well, it, um, it, uh, I had you know, experience working on the lift uh, in, at Lake Louise, now a different kind of lift, but John Lehman was very good about teaching us how lifts worked and a lot about them. So anyway, I saw Cliff, and, and uh, his words were, I'll give you a chance, and uh, so I started work for him. Now, the interesting thing about Sunshine in those days was it was a growing resort with no water. And uh, literally, it, uh, the creek tended to dry up and the place, uh, as, as it got busier, needed more water. And so uh, Cliff was trying to haul water from Rock Island Lake, which is just over in BC. Uh, he had beautiful Tucker Snowcat. That's one of those machines with the four tracks. And, and it was crazy Cliff's Cadillac, it was known as. And 
It co cost more than a Cadillac. And, and uh, they were hauling water in a 500-gallon tank, or planning to haul water in a 500-gallon tank, pulled on a sled behind the tucker. And uh, so I was over um, working on that. And uh, when it came time to actually drive this tank of water over, I uh, was delegated to do it. I've been driving the, the tucker a bit. And so I had mentioned to Bob, Bob Meggs, the, Meg, Bob, anyway, Bob, the lift foreman, that I said, when we're going downhill, shouldn't I have some chains to put around the, you know, I, I'm 18, and, you know, I'm, a, I'm saying, going downhill, shouldn't we have something to put brakes on? Oh, hell no, he said. You'll, you'll have to pull it hard downhill, he said. It won't go anywhere. So that's fine. I got in the tucker, and I'm heading over the hill, over the divide, and down the dell. And I wasn't on the side hill much, and all of a sudden, the tucker started going over. And I thought, this can't be happening. It's, you know, it's not a side hill. And over it went, and there it was, lying on its side. Crazy Cliff's Cadillac, and the t water tank was there. And I knew that if you rolled the snowcat, your career was over. <laughs> so I started walking down toward the old lodge, and Cliff's office was in there, and I was just on that last bench of strawberry, and I saw Cliff come out of the old lodge and start walking up. I did not stop. There was, it was pointless. I knew I was out of here. So I walked down and met Cliff partway and said the most inane thing. I said, Cliff, I've rolled the snowcat. And he said, I heard. <laughs> and then he said, let's go get it back up. Now, let's, my mind went very quickly. Let's means let us. So that seemed to include me. So, so we went up, up to the dell, and there's this poor Tucker line there. And um, Cliff and Bob Powell, B Bob Powell was the name, they were talking about, well, we can put cables around here, and we can run them up to those bushes up there, and we can pull it up. And I'm keeping pretty quiet because, you know, when you're on thin ice, you don't talk too much. <laughs> but I'm listening to all this, and finally I said, well, listen, Cliff, there's a lot of snow here. Why don't we just dig a hole above the snowcat and roll it in? Good idea. So we got shovels, and we dug this great big pit, and we rolled the snowcat in. And Cliff said, okay, take it away, <laughs> which is quite something. That was, you know, and so I, I uh, was then the snowcat driver. So, but again, you know, I, one of these things where I thought I was on pretty thin ice. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the start of, uh, um, I guess, around 15, 20 years, great years at mm -hmm. Sunshine. Yeah. 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 It was. So you operated the strawberry tea bar a bit too. Yeah. I, uh, I was a lift operator, but I did notice at that time that instructors seemed to have more fun. And... <laughs> And so that spring, I went to Vernon and took my ASI, Assistant Ski Instructor, as it was called then. And I passed, and Jerry Johnson gave me a job for the next year in the ski school. So that was good. I really enjoyed that. And that was, we had the hotel then, and uh, Sunshine ran ski weeks, sort of a six-day package with, with ski lessons and lifts included. So you got to know the guests really well, and it was a nice experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, Sunshine is uh, the 60s. Uh, the Trans-Canada Highway has just been built. Jet air travel is just coming on. <coughs> the baby boomers, ski resorts. Yeah. You, you hit it right at the right time. Yeah, Sunshine was really just taking off. And uh, it, um, you know, I remember when, you know, counts were, you know, midweek were very quiet. I told you about Lake Louise at 16 skiers, but... Yeah. But uh, Sunshine was pretty quiet too. But the Ski Week business picked up. And, and uh, actually, a fellow that you interviewed here, Roy Anderson, was teaching. And he uh, was working at the Skiers Ski Shop in Calgary. And he was also selling Ski Weeks. And he really did a great job. And so the, the Ski Week business took off. Yeah. And so Sunshine was really an all-inclusive and quite successful resort. Yeah. And so those years... Um, I guess 65 to 69, you got three levels of ski instructor and you got 
just one year after the other, and and you got a mountain guides license. Tell us about all of them. Well, just bang, bang, bang. Most of these courses were notorious. that You took them two or three times to pass. And uh, I got my ASI uh, again when I was 18, and the next year I took my what they called CSI, International Certification, and I passed that. And the next year I took my mountain guide, and I passed that. And the, the, the final year of the four, I got my my senior instructor's examiner certification. So it was pretty quick. I was a guide and a senior instructor when I was 21. Wow. So, Yeah, and you never failed an exam. Never failed, no. <laughs> I, I, I was a good talker in those days. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. Yeah, that is amazing. Uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about that guides exam. So the first guides exam, ACMG exam, was in 66, and Kiwi was on that, and he's in the room. There he is. But your exam in 67 was the second one, and you had a great group of guys that you went through with. We did, yeah. And uh, Hans Moser was really the, um, he picked up the uh, Association of Canadian Mountain Guides and put it at his feet, and, and really was good about getting the courses going, and, and he was quite a... a uh, inspiration. He was, you know, the most, he was the successful mountain guide in Canada at the time. And so he, he knew that there were a lot of local people interested, so they ran a course on weekends. And it was the same length of course, days and exam and stuff, but it was on, on uh, weekends. And there was people like Bob Geber and uh, quite a group. It was a good group, Bernie yeah. Schieser. Yeah. And Bernie and I had intended to start a uh, a mountaineering camp for teenagers, and so that worked out well for us. Right. So almost immediately after getting your guide's license, you set up a very successful business. Well, it, yeah, it didn't make much money, but it was successful. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's really, uh, it's really been important in the lives of a lot of people, and uh, I think one of them, Peter Poole, or Peter Year, yeah, yeah, Peter Poole was there, uh, yeah, all yeah. sorts of people. You you really you put it together. So tell us a little bit about this company, High Horizon. Well, it was called. yeah, it was. Um, I had met a fellow from the states who was um, up in Banff Park with three or four kids, sort of traveling around doing some climbing and things. And I thought that was a really good idea. And uh, so I I sort of I chatted with Bernie about it. And we decided to give it a try. Now, of course, to do that in the National Park, you have to have a guide's license, so we went to the course, and we both passed. The, um, our marketing was neophyte, we might say, and uh, we had six kids the first year, and that was an uneconomic number, but we agreed that we would do it because we said we would, and you know they're counting on it, but that would be it. And then we found that there was such an enthusiastic response, both from the kids and from the parents, that we thought, well, we better keep at this. And so the next year it went to 18 kids. and, and it, So we did it for quite a few years, and it worked out very well. And uh, got a lot of young people into, into mountaineering, and we ran some ski camps and uh, hiking trips and that sort of thing. It was, yeah. 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 So, so you, uh, pretty quickly, you, you ran it at Lake O'Hara. Start. We started at Lake O'Hara for the first couple of years, but Lake O'Hara was getting more and more demand. And so Parks suggested we look elsewhere. And so we actually went down in Kananaskis country and uh, we we're up by the Robertson Glacier because we wanted something with a glacier, with rock climbing where we could teach climbing and that sort of thing. And so the um, K country worked out. There wasn't K country in those days. It was no. just Alberta no, Bush. And yeah. the road didn't even go over all the way, did it? Um, did it yeah, it did, but it was just a dirt. Dirt, yeah. dirt track. Yeah, you yeah. could barely get down yeah. into Kananaskis That's right. from the Smith Dorian. Yeah, it really wasn't a route. Yeah. yeah, so it was way back there, and yeah. over those years, <laughs> you introduced hundreds of young people to the mountain. We did, yeah. No, yeah. no, it was a good yeah. success. Yeah, it was a great success. And a lot of them are still alive. Here's Peter as yeah. proof of it. <laughs> yeah, 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 good. So back to sunshine, you're ski instructing in the winter, you're running high horizons in the summer, um, and then Cliff comes to you with a big offer. Tell, tell me about 
Cliff and his yeah. offer. Well, I got to know Cliff quite well, of course, and and uh, I wasn't shy about telling him things that could be improved in the resort and that sort of thing. I mean, in a very friendly way. We used to talk together, and and one day I was giving Cliff the benefit of my wisdom on some issue, and he said, well, how would you like my job? And I thought that he was sort of, oh, well, how would you like all my problems? And I backed, you know, I backpedaled, and I said, gee, I didn't mean to blah, blah. And he said, no, no. He said, I, I'm serious. We, I want to retire, and I've talked to the board, and they want me to hire a replacement. We all agree it should be you. <laughs> Let me think about it. Yes. <laughs> And I was 22 at the time, and so, so um, it. Um, I I was working in the ski school, and so I talked to Jerry, and he didn't mind, and I went and moved over and had a desk job. Well, yeah, not just a desk job, but it was. Um, and Cliff, of course, was certainly had the best reputation of any ski area operator in Western Canada, and uh, he really did. And so he was a. Wonderful guy to have as a mentor. Really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. he was going to coach you to take over. That's right. That was the yeah. objective. Yeah. And, of course, now Bev, his wife, Bev, uh, Cliff's wife, um, she was a big part. But at, at that time, she had sort of stepped out of Sunshine. Yeah. Well, Bev was a very big part of it because in the early years after they bought Sunshine, um, Cliff really ran the outdoor operation and Bev ran the indoor and the business. And she was a very hard-working, sharp woman. Um, she um, had a bit of a temper, but she, um, she could be short with people. Yeah. But uh, anyway, Bev and I got along very well. And uh, so she was very supportive. I think, well, she was on the board of directors, and she was one of the ones that decided I should be hired. And uh, she was happy because it, she wanted to get out of it. Yeah. So I was moving in to take over that. And then uh, just shortly after that, your life <laughs> took a complete side turn. Yeah, well, um, Cliff had said, well, he wanted me to continue with mountain guiding, and he knew that we were committed to uh, Bernie and I to, to various operations. And we had run some heli skiing on weekends down out of Golden that year, and we thought we should uh, have a little better knowledge of the terrain. And so a local fellow... Um, um, Bernie Royal had an airplane, and so we went down to Golden in the airplane and fueled up, and then we went out to look at the terrain northwest of Golden. And uh, at one time, at one point, uh, we looked up a valley, and Bernie sort of asked, if, "You know, do you want to?" Go? I said, "Sure, go." So he turned up it, but the trouble was the valley climbed faster than the little Cessna could. And there was, I think, a bit of a downdraft, and you could feel a whoop. And so uh, Bernie was um, not a highly experienced pilot, and he cranked the airplane over at its side to turn. And as I've learned later, when you turn an airplane, you need more airspeed to maintain flight when it's on its angle like that. And so Bernie turned it hard, and it just dropped. And I was looking out of my window, watching the trees come up. And... Uh, that was sort of the end of that flight. Yeah, yeah. So just to clarify, this is Bernie Royal. Bernard Royal, yeah. Because there's two Bernies yeah, here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, so you went into the trees. Well, I, I have no memory of that. The, la the movie stopped of the trees just about there. And uh, I woke up, and I was lying in the snow, face in the snow. And uh, it uh, was very quiet, and we were in big, big timber. And I uh, sort of sat up, and where my face was was an imprint of, <laughs> imprint of my face in blood. And uh, I, I felt sort of sore in my jaw, and I went like this, and I felt all my teeth as I did that. And uh, I hadn't been very gracious in getting out of the airplane. I had gone through something. And uh, anyway, I um, felt okay other than that, and I... So I looked around, and then I saw a tree leaning at a very strange angle, and I hiked up a little bit toward that. It wasn't very far. And there was the wreckage of the airplane and a tree right across my seat, and, and uh, Bernie was wedged in his seat, and uh, it, uh, he was very clearly 
not with us anyway. He was very clearly dead. I went and, and checked and he was already cold because this was the next day as far as I could piece it together that I'd been out for 24 hours or the better part of. So then I was, um, you know, no flight plan about valleys that were going to go up and that sort of thing. And um, big timber, as I said, you could not see the sky from where the airplane was. But we had a ski doo trail road packed um, a kilometer or so down the valley. And I figure, well, if I can get down to that, I can uh, walk out on that and uh, I'll get out to there. Um, some people had a farm several kilometers away. So I started out and uh, the snow was deep and the going was hard. And I tied some rags around my boots, uh, around the top of my boots to keep snow out. But uh, the going was so tough, I had this bright idea of making snowshoes. And so I tried with some branches to use the rags, and that didn't work at all. That was a failure. But now I had taken the rags off. So I, I floundered through until I got to our ski road. And when I got there, I remember getting there, and I remember falling, but I don't remember hitting. I just passed out when I got there. It's so destination-oriented. And... Uh, um, again, I don't know how long I was unconscious there, but I think it was through to the next day. And I woke up and it was my feet. It was an instant thought. And they had been nicely packed in snow all night and all for that length of time. And uh, so they were sort of white and cold. That I, so I, I got the boots off and I uh, sort of cleaned them up as best I could. And then I started walking out. And uh, the walking was okay. It was not bad. And I got about halfway, and then I started breaking through. And you just about, just about get all my weight on the foot, and all of a sudden, <laughs> up to my knee. And this didn't last very long. I went about 50 feet like that. And so I sat down under a nice, beautiful tree that melted out under the tree and, again, went to sleep. I don't know how long, but all I know is that the total from the time of the crash till I got out was five days. And... Uh, this was sort of, I think each of my little rests was, was a day or so. So then I, uh, I um, woke up in the morning, or the, I guess, quote, the next day, and I was really cold. And I, I had a jacket with me and a down jacket, but I was really cold, and I'm huddling trying to keep warm. If it's that cold, snow's frozen, boots on, get out of here, which is exactly what I did. And I walked out without stopping until I was on this last long straight stretch and I knew that the road was plowed just around there and some people lived in a trailer not far away. So I came around the corner and there's the straight stretch and at the far end of it there was a man standing there. And I thought, very strange, you know, that what, whatever he's doing standing out in the bush. But I thought of what to say and I yelled, help. <laughs> I thought that would be clear. And he came rushing over and when he got there I collapsed and and uh, he said, are you one of the fellows in the airplane? And I said, yep. And he said, I'll go get help. And I said, no, don't, don't do that. Just, just uh, give me a hand. And I said, how far are you parked? And he said, you know, a couple hundred meters. So he helped me down to his truck, and he got in the radio and radioed his office and said, would you please call the RCMP and say, I've got John Gow with me, and we're going to the hospital. So there I was out. Yeah, you were out, but then began... A grueling. How many days were you in the hospital? Only a hundred. <laughs> but anyway, I um, my my friend drove me down to the Golden Hospital, and to my surprise, there was my brother, my father, my mother, a bunch of people I knew. They had been all down because of this search that was on for us, and it was, but they were searching an area the size of Switzerland. You know, it's not not very easy. But um, anyway, I got in the hospital there and. Uh, they fairly quickly, after the doctors examined me, put me in an ambulance and headed off to Calgary. And as we were approaching, we were in Yoho Park. We just got into Yoho Park. And I'm lying on the stretcher asleep in the back of this ambulance, and just the driver and I. And all of a sudden, I could feel he had hit the brakes and was skidding. And I sat up, and in front of us was a big elk. And I thought, oh, shit, I get I'm going to die in an ambulance. <laughs> anyway, he swerved and he missed the elk. And so, so we drove into Calgary and we got to the Holy Cross Hospital, which was my new home for three months. And uh, yeah. 
So that was quite something. Yeah, but uh, they fixed you up as best they could. Yeah. Cliff, of course, and Bev supported you through all this. Completely. I, you know, you, to, to show you the mark of the people, uh, Cliff and Bev, I uh, had really been back working for them for a couple months at the most, a couple months. And I was away for three and a half months and did not miss a day's pay, you know. And, that's, and they were a very small company, you know, and, and money was short for them. So that was, they were very, very good to me. Yeah. And, yeah, and uh, Cliff came in to see me quite frequently and that sort of stuff. The, um, I, but I thought, well, the, you know, I had no idea what was wrong with my feet other than they were now red and swollen. And so I figured I'll be here for a few days and we'll get out of here. And the next day, a parade of doctors came in, and there was an arterial surgeon, there was an orthopedic surgeon, there was, I think there was about five surgeons, and each one had four or five residents. And, in, and I was sort of a celebrity in the hospital, too, because of the press that had happened. So I'm really wondering about all these doctors and all these specialists, and I thought, this, you know, this is not that good. So I phoned the, the doctor I knew best, and that's Smitty Gardner. And, uh, and many of the people here, I'm sure, know Smitty Gardner or knew him. And so I phoned Smitty, and uh, he uh, was a doctor who uh, spent a lot of time at Sunshine, but also um, he was practicing in Calgary. He was a wonderful, kindly old gentleman. And so Smitty said, well, tell me who your doctors are. And I told him, and he said, you've got the best group of doctors you can get in Western Canada. Just stay with them. Some years later, I found out that Bev phoned Smitty, and Smitty put together the team of doctors. <laughs> so, anyway, so, yeah. But anyway, um, it um, it became apparent that my feet were not in great shape, and uh, it was not frostbite. One of the doctors said it was what he had read about in the First World War of trench warfare, where people were in cold water for too long. Yeah. And it damaged the circulation in their feet. And Anyway, to make a long story short, I was in the operating room 10 times, and they sort of whittled away. And, uh, you know, the first on my right leg, first it was the midfoot, and then the ankle, and then finally they had to go about six inches below the knee, which is the way it is now. And the other one, they were able to save most of it by um, taking it off at the midfoot, my left foot, and then uh, a skin graft, which... I had to lie in my back for about three weeks while the skin graft took. But anyway, because of all that, I was able to be pretty mobile again. Yeah, yeah. So they, uh, yeah, and I think you said by November you were out skiing again. Well, I got back to Sunshine, and uh, it, um, there I was. And uh, in November, we had snow, and strawberry was groomed, and I was in my office, and I'm thinking, this has got to try this. So I borrowed someone else's. I borrowed Bob Han's ski jacket. and I uh, didn't know much about what to do, but I just put a ski boot on this one on my below knee leg, and, and the other one I clamped it on as tight as I could because I didn't have a foot for it yet. Yeah. So I just clamped it in, and so I went over to Strawberry, and uh, I, you know, I'd taught skiing for five years. I knew how to ski. This is not a... Any, any big news. So I climbed up and I just went through the, through the exact same procedure you would with a new beginner. I climbed up and slid straight down and stopped. And, well, that worked. So I climbed up and I skied down. And I made a turn to the left and that worked. So I did the same again. One more turn to the, to the right. And then I went up and I, I made three turns and they worked. So I went over and got on strawberry tea bar and went up the tea bar. <laughs> Actually, we had angel chair then. I went up angel chair. Yeah, yeah, and wow. uh, and I met I met a bunch of the ski school, and they were all excited, and they skied down with me. But it worked; it was just fine. Right. And so, um, over the years, we refined, and I learned more about, you know, having proper angles and that sort of stuff. When I got my left prosthesis, then it was just boom. It felt like I was back skiing, same. Right. And uh, the next year, I actually I took the pre course for at the. the, the Examiners in the Instructors Alliance take a pre-course each year where they are taught what they're going to teach the candidates to pass ski instructors courses. So I, I um, signed up for the pre-course. I was a senior. I can do that. 
And uh, we're out with a guy by name, Mario Podorosiak, who is from, from uh, Laurentians. And so we'd, we were doing all these things. And the only time, the only correction he gave me, and it was repeated, was, that's a nice, John, but more flexion in the ankles, more flexion in the ankles. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this guy is, you know, he, he's joking, you know. But anyway, um, Anyway, this, this keeps on, and we, we get on the lift, and, and, and Mario is going up with uh, Nip Bradford, Wayne Bradford from Kimberly, and Mario's in a bad mood, and Nip said, what's the matter? He said, oh, he said, why do some people even bother coming to these pre-courses? And Nip said, well, what, what's the matter? You know, everyone's doing really well. Oh, that John guy. I tell him once, I've told him 10 times to flex his ankles, nothing. <laughs> so Nipper says, well, Mario, think back about a year and a half. Alliance Senior, airplane crash, lost both feet. Mario was a very swarthy guy. Mario Nipper said he just went white. And he said, that's a him? <laughs> so yeah. so that's, a, that's a him. Mario would not talk to me for the rest of the pre-course. He just, yeah. it, it was really funny. He, he was so embarrassed, but anyway. So, but, but skiing came right back. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, and, and of course you... You had another, uh, so that's 69, 70, so you had another 12 years at Sunshine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, you worked with Cliff, and then you took over when Cliff retired that's in right. 77. Mm -hmm. You did the master plan together, Yeah, the gondola. Yeah, once the master plan was approved, then Cliff retired, and he actually had, when he initially hired me to work with him, he had said he'd you know, stay around for a couple of years. Well, he stayed for a number of years, and that was fine. Yeah. Worked for me, worked for him. Um, but once we had the master plan approved, then, then Cliff headed out, and, and there I was. Yeah, and you and Cliff uh, mapped out the line for the, for the gondola. Well, we did. You know, the first thing was the Parks Canada were tired of sort of people applying for, at ski areas, applying for one lift and then another lift or one facility. And they said, you have to have a master plan. And so uh, we hired a company, Acres Consulting, and they had some people that were expert, and they were to do a master plan. And one of the things they came up with was that we were, other than the terrain that we'd already lifted, we're fairly short of new terrain. And uh, the... Um, we had we had to lift up up uh, Great Divide, and uh, so there were things like a, a new tea, a chair out of Teepee Town, but it was still short of terrain. And one evening, I was driving down. We, in those days, Cliff and I drove station wagons up to Sunshine because there were our ambulances during the day when people hurt themselves. <laughs> we had vehicles that we could put a stretcher in. So one evening, I was driving down in the spring as we're pondering this business of ski terrain. And I got to Zone 15, and you can look out and see Goatsai, the, the terrain of Goatsai, and there had been no discussion about that. And it all of a sudden hit me. It was obvious there was a whole bunch of good ski terrain. And so the next morning I came in and said, Cliff, I've seen the future. It's yeah. Goatsai. And that's, of course, where we're skiing now, and it worked out very well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, of course... It works with the gondola, which stops it. <clears throat> well, that was the other thing is, is that Sunshine, right from the, from the get-go when I started there, um, and many of you are here, or most of you here remember, we had a bus system that was an absolutely remarkable thing. Brewsters ran, they're mostly school buses, and Brewsters ran buses into Sunshine. There were about 15, 16 passing zones, yeah. and the drivers became highly expert. They, they could be... One fellow would say, you know, so-and-so off the bottom, and the other guy would say, well, it's number 18 off the top. Okay, I'll see you at 13. And that's where they'd meet. And they would meet without even touching the brakes. They'd just go by. The, the obvious thing was that sooner or later, there was going to be a bad accident. That you had some absolute right-angle corners with canyon below them, you know, like Zone 12. And, uh, and even though the bus system, had, I think it hauled in, almost 5,000 people in, on its biggest day. It wasn't popular, and um, it, it was probably doomed if it was a serious accident. Parks would just say, forget it. 
So we were looking at various transportation systems and a gondola appeared to be the, the, uh, the most um, reasonable way to do it and user-friendly and that sort of thing. So again, with the consultants in tow, we went down and we sort of walked what we thought would be the gondola line. And uh, it, when you come up out of the parking lot, it, those of you who know Sunshine, there's a big cliff. And the consultants had glibly said, well, you just go straight up over that cliff. And so we walked and we, we got to the cliff and we looked down it. and There was no way. It was just not going to happen. And so all of a sudden, the whole dream of a gondola is lying on the floor shattered. And uh, I, I was a neophyte in gondolas, and I said, well, you can put a curve on a gondola, can't you? Yeah. So we walked down, and there was this knoll at zone four, which is right where the, where the curve station sits now. And so it added fair cost to the gondola, but it solved the problem because what you are really concerned about is, is evacuation of any lift. That if the lift breaks down and you can't move it, you better be able to get people out. And we weren't going to be lowering people down that cliff. So anyway, with the line now, it works well. It's yeah. been well received by the public. Yeah, and it worked great. Uh, so what year was that you built the gondola? 80, 81? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. wow, and that just changed. Changed the whole place. It, yeah. it did a couple things. The, with the buses, of course, there was the, the risk of, of buses being stuck and hold-ups hold on the road. Also, it didn't make a very pleasant ski resort to have all those buses in the yard in front of the day lodge, if you remember them. Yeah. And uh, so... The, the idea of, of a proper of a gondola really made sense in every regard. And the parks were, were quite keen on it, too. They were happy to see the bus road gone. Good. Yeah. And it worked great and uh, still works great. But then you got another curveball in 82. Yeah. The, the owners of Sunshine, it was a company in, uh, in the east, and they lurched from one crisis to the other, and finally they decided to sell Sunshine. And uh, Sunshine was sold, and uh, the new owners were going to provide their own management, so I left. And uh, once I had left, I sort of looked around and thought what to do. And, and uh, I actually had talked to the owners of, uh, of Silver Star Mountain, in, or Silver Star as it was known as, in uh, the Okanagan. And so I went out to see them, and very shortly afterwards, had borrowed a pile of money, and we bought Silver Star. Yeah, you and Norm Creer? Myself and Norm and uh, John Hindle, who uh, was the original shareholder. That's right. Yeah. 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 And uh, it, it was essentially a day ski area. Where there were some cabins there that, that had been built. It was in a provincial park. Um, but then they, they took the base area out of the park, sort of a donut, a hole in the donut. And um, they, were, they had done a master plan, and uh, it didn't really, to me, solve the problems of of, of uh, Silver Star, and that was relatively short runs and um, mostly intermediate or lower intermediate ski terrain, some some advanced but not much. So then, under the under the guise of will they never learn, I uh, got a pilot with a nice airplane, <laughs> <laughs> and I went flying. And what I quickly discovered was something that no one had even mentioned, and that's called Putnam Creek. And there is, on the north side of the mountain, this deep valley. It's a bit of a slope on the top to get down to it, but then this big bowl and, and uh, what looked like a lot of ski terrain. And uh, the day I took those photographs, the one major ridge, it was just hit, the sun was just hitting right along the ridge. So that is called Sunny Ridge today. And uh, so anyway, I went back to the, back to the uh, provincial government because, again, you know, my career to date had been in the National Park where you, you know, you would not be going into the National Park and suggesting you're going to build a new ski area down in the next valley. But I went into the uh, Regional Director of Lands and Housing up in Kamloops and I had a, some maps and drawings and I showed him and he said, you'd do that? That's fantastic. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the approval process. <laughs> wow. So, so we... Um, the, uh, we put in uh, a big lift down into Putnam Creek and it changed Silver Star dramatically. It's, it's yeah. a good ski trip. Silver Star's big blessing is it has great snow. It really is a good snow area. It, 
it's right up there with sunshine. Yeah. And so it, that, once it had some better ski terrain, and we also did some real estate development, which you're sort of stuck with in, if you're in BC. So we, we, we created a little village area where we could have hotels, and that's all happened, and, and some single family residential area and that sort of thing. So it's yeah. worked very well. It's a nice yeah. resort. Yeah, it was very, very successful. Yeah. Um, before we move on, let's just take a little side trip. Somewhere in there, um, you had some really interesting friends and adventures. You spent a bunch of time with Pierre Trudeau paddling <laughs> rivers and skiing. Uh, what years was those? Seventies. Yeah, in the seventies. Yeah. yeah, I um, I um, met Pierre Trudeau at, at. Oh, he came skiing. He came skiing to Sunshine, and um, he um, he told the guy from Parks that he didn't want someone from the area bugging him. He just wanted to go skiing. And uh, however, when when he got there, he uh, used my office as a change room and stuff, and. And then uh, it became very apparent, actually, he, he would appreciate someone to guide him around the area. So I went skiing with Pierre. And um, from that, we became good friends over the years. And uh, I was in a group from, mostly from the east, that uh, we did a northern canoe trip every year, quite often in rivers that there was really no record of being paddled. And so uh, the next year that we were doing a trip, uh, I mentioned to the group, and of course they were very keen to have Pierre come. So he came on a on that canoe trip with us, and we uh, did some paddling around Banff as well, and that yeah. sort of thing. And so, yeah, 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 that's pretty interesting. And you also told me that uh, you met the Queen and you met Fidel Castro <laughs> too. Yeah, well, yeah, you hung out with the great. Yeah, you hang out with the good ones. Yeah, yeah. Well. Somewhere along the line, I became the chairman of the National Advisory Council on Fitness and Amateur Sport, which is a, quite a title. And uh, that, would, that was a group that were to advise the Minister of Sports on, uh, on, on matters. And uh, uh, I was in Ottawa at a meeting, and uh, the Queen and Prince Philip were in town. And for some reason, I was invited to come to a reception. And uh, it, it was quite fun because... First, you, uh, there was a banquet, and I was actually at the head table. I had lunch with the queen. I'm at the same table. I'm at the end, and she's way down there. <laughs> but anyway, um, the, um, at the reception, before the, uh, before the luncheon, we we're meeting, and uh, I in, met the queen, and it's very proper, and then talking to Prince Philip. And, uh, and Philip said to me, and what are you doing here? Because he had just met the greats of Canadian sports, you know, and, and there was this, this amazing tone, and what are you doing here? And I muttered something about, well, I'm a skier and a mountaineer, and Pierre was standing beside me, and he stomped on my foot and said, yes, your, your highness, he does it with no feet. <laughs> 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 and all of a sudden we had the Queen's attention, and, and Philip started pumping me with questions about this. And, of course, these royal things are choreographed to the minute. So I'm, I'm answering questions to Prince Philip, and standing behind him is a guy from the Canadian government going... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was, that was uh, meeting, the, uh, meeting the Queen and... The Queen was quite interested in the conversation too, so it was funny. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And then um, you mentioned who else? Uh, Fidel. Oh, Fidel Castro, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, again, uh, this uh, chairman thing, I was invited down to Cuba, and it was just sort of a ho hum thing. And um, I think the Minister of Sports of Canada was on that trip. And anyway, I was. Uh, around our guest house, wherever that was, and all of a sudden someone shouts, El Jefe wants to see Mr. Gao. El Jefe means the boss. And so there's a car waiting, and in the car I go, and we go over to some fairly secure office complex, and in, and I am in there with Fidel Castro. <laughs> and, and he again 
was quite taken with the whole foot shtick, you know. It's, 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 it's a good opener, it's a good conversation. <laughs> so, yeah. wow. so, and Heather was with me as well, so she, she and I were there in Fidel's office, and he was very pleasant to us, very yeah. kind. Yeah. 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 So in there, you got married, you married Heather, and uh, I think you fathered six children along the way. I did. <laughs> There is some explanation on that. The <laughs> In the first case, marrying Heather was a very smart thing to do. And we had planned to have three kids. And uh, so we had uh, three kids, uh, two girls and a boy. And uh, everyone said to me, well, you've got your son now. You can stop. And Okay. But then for some reason, along came number four. And she is, where is she? There she is. Hi. This is Michelle. And um, so that, now we had three girls and a boy, and that should be enough. And then one day I came home and said to Heather, you're what? <laughs> and she was. And it turned out that it was twins. <laughs> and there were two boys, so that evened it up. And then I was given great credit by some people that I could actually get my numbers right and have three girls and three boys. So the... Uh, Great credit to Heather. They're all wonderful people, and they are nice to be with, and they're well, good people. Right, guys? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that was uh, one of the brighter things that happened. Right. Good for you. Good for you. And they're all going to look after me in my old age. Yeah. Good. And uh, yeah, so... so when you were developing Silver Star, um, most of the time you lived in Victoria. You, we did. Yeah. Seems strange. Um, having come from Banff, um, when we got to, I, first I commuted from Banff to Silver Star for a year or two, and, and I recall telling Heather that if I keep it up, I'll be mounted on the front end of a semi. And uh, so then... We lived in uh, Vernon. We rented a house in Vernon and lived there for a year and a half or so. And oddly enough, we didn't. We were we were used to Banff, where we knew sort of lots of people. Look at them all here. <laughs> but you know, lots of people had a good social life, and somehow we didn't click with people in Vernon. It just they. Uh, I don't know quite what it was, but we found it to be uh, um, sort of off-putting, if you would. And you know, would invite people over, have little dinner party, never hear from them again. It was quite weird. So after about a year of that, we said to hell with it. And we liked Victoria. And uh, we had a little place at Silver Star, and so I could commute and you know, drive or fly. And so we did that. Yeah. And we lived in, in uh, Victoria for quite a while and loved it. it was a, it's a great city to live in. And it was a good change. You know, it, it, yeah. it, um, um, A different experience. It's really the first city I had lived in since I was a kid. So it was good. Yeah, yeah. And then you even moved farther beyond that. <laughs> so did, did you move, did you sell Silver Star and move? Or, yeah, yeah how we did that work? Did. Well, I, yeah, I sold out my interest in Silver Star and yeah. after, I, I think we had it for about 12 years. Yeah. But um, then we um, upped with, um, with, uh, a group of children and went to France for a couple of years. Yeah. And uh, and the uh, young ones were in French school, which was not a popular thing. I, according to, well, Michelle could describe it better, but sit down, shut up, memorize this. Is that about it? Yeah, very different system compared to the nice little private school in Victoria they were used to. But literally, it wasn't. It was not a great success. We loved living in Aix. We were in Aix-en-Provence in the south of France. Great little city. And um, the uh, people were friendly and everything like that. But the, uh, we really decided we couldn't put the three young ones through a whole school career like that. It just wasn't a very nice thing. Mish was our canary in the mine because she loved school in, in Canada. And I believe you hated it in France. Did I get that right? And so we... We looked around, and for some bizarre reason, when we were deciding where to go next, I said, well, what about Thailand? <laughs> where I got that one, I'm not sure. But um, we looked around, and we uh, found that Phuket was a 
resort island, sort of not dissimilar to Banff, and in that respect, just hot. And uh, so we moved to Phuket, and actually, we still have a house there, and which Heather is there trying to sell right now. Yeah. Yeah. But that was a success. It was like, the school was very good, and um, it got approved by the children. And while we were there, we had a, a good friend uh, whose daughter was going to school with, with Mish, I think, Dudley's daughter. Um, and Dudley was a yacht captain. And uh, any time Dudley saw Fraser and Matthew, here's Fraser here, he would hammer at them that the career for you is to be a yacht captain. And so when they finished high school, Matt got a job as a deckhand. You, you start at the bottom. It's just like starting as a lift operator. So Fraser got a really nice job at a resort and guest services. And uh, with low pay, Matt got a relatively unpleasant deckhand job with good pay. And so that um, didn't last more than what, about a year, Fraser, I guess. And so Fraser also joined him. And uh, they have both made yachting a career, and uh, I, I could let Fraser speak to it better, but anyway, they are both yacht captains of a couple hundred foot long yachts with billionaire owners and traveling the world, and there we are. Wow. So we're pleased that you could join us. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but yeah. it's an interesting career that wouldn't have happened to us if we hadn't moved to Phuket. You just wouldn't have dreamed of it, you know. Yeah. It's, it's quite something, so. So everything works, you know. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and meanwhile, Cheryl, our eldest daughter, is in London and just got her PhD. And Christine, our second daughter, is living right here in beautiful Canmore, Bow Valley. And, uh, and she and her partner, her partner and boss, Bob, <laughs> I won't even try and explain what they do, but it's to do with marketing. Software. Uh, marketing software, yeah. And... Uh, and Matt's not here today, but anyway, there we are. That's our group. So, David? Oh, David. Yeah, David. <laughs> hey. You know, I try and forget. <laughs> David actually was our hell on wheels as a child. But anyway, anyway, he now is a, is a teacher in Coquitlam, and a high school teacher, and wow. which if you'd known him when he was a kid, you wouldn't have believed he'd ever be teaching teaching children, but anyway. So they've all worked out. None of them are in jail, and so they're, it's, it's, it's going pretty well. Good. Well, yeah. well, well done to you and Heather. Well yeah, done. largely credit to Heather. Yeah. 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 And then uh, you started coming back. Well, you had that career. I think we have just enough time. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, you got involved in the legal end of ski yeah, resorts. Yeah, I did. When I... Um, was at Silver Star, um, a lawyer who was defending a, a, uh, a case on the coast that fell in m sort of my field of expertise about ski areas, asked me, this is Robert Kennedy, asked me if I would be uh, an expert, and that involved investigating the accident and writing a report that compared what the area had done, uh, compare it to industry standards, and that sort of stuff, and, and comment on the safety of their operation and that sort of stuff. So I did that for Robert, and then one case led to another one to another one, and, and so then I was sort of the expert in Western Canada. Jimmy Miles, lawyer in Calgary, used me, and, uh, and then um, a, a lawyer in Australia, um, while we are I think we had just moved to Phuket, heard about me, and uh, 25 trips to Australia later, and so I went and I got to know the ski areas in Australia very well and uh, did a lot of work there. One day I was saying to the general manager of the nicest area, Threadville, that some day, I said, someday some bright opposing barrister will say, and Mr. Gow, when was the last time you taught skiing? <laughs> and I said, a lifetime ago is not a good answer. And so he said, well, come and teach here. So that season I went and taught at Threadville. <laughs> so I, it kept the credentials going, and I had a really good time. It's a lovely area, and people are good to me, and so, so that was good. That was my sort of final career in the ski business, and and lately I've been spending more time in Banff and in the Bow Valley, and uh, and uh, for those of you in Banff, uh, I actually am living in. How do I say that? C word. 
Oh, Canmore. Oh, Canmore. <laughs> this was not my choice. Heather is an artist. Heather's a painter, and she found this, this place to buy with a ni really nice apartment on the second floor, but the main floor is a big studio, and that will become Heather's art studio. You couldn't find that in Banff, so there we are. No, but you came back to Banff. You spent, um, yeah, a number of the last, yeah. uh, for a long time. I remember skiing with you uh, 12 years ago, That's 2010. Right. Yeah, no, I've been spending ba time in Banff straight yeah. right through, yeah. yeah. Kept a place up on Grizzly Street. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. At, yeah. at the Giever, yeah. Yeah, so. but you've sort of come full, yeah. full, full circle. Full You're circle. Here I am, Valley. Unem unemployed skier. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you can. Was that the UI ski team or whatever it was? Called? Yeah, but you have to have a job first. You see, yeah. that's the, that's the hook yeah. on that one. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, good. Well, it's like, wonderful to be back here. And then look at this. We've got locals night here at the White. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, and you're riding your bike. We've got to talk about Mount Norquay and your cycling. I do ride a bike, and. Um, Running with my feet is not a grand idea. It doesn't really work very well, but cycling does. And so in the last two years, I have cycled up the Norquay Road 257 times. <laughs> wow. And the real reason is you can coast all the way home. <laughs> that's great. But it's a nice ride. It yeah, really is. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Well, uh, Anything else? I think we covered all the points on the list. Yeah, we've got through it. Anything you can think no, of? No, I think that. The, oh, well, we did miss one thing, and that was uh, <laughs> your medals um, in, the, in the Paralympics. You, you got gold medals. Well, that's right true. When it was, right when the, it was first started. Yeah, when the, when the, when the Paralympics started, I, I went to the uh, first world championships for disabled skiing. And um, I, I did win some races. The, the nicest compliment was the French coach challenged me and said, he's not an amputee. And I had to go to a meeting and pull up my pants. And the, of course, the French coach, being French, he looked and said, of course he's an amputee. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, so I have, I, I, uh, I went to the, first uh, world championships for disabled skiing and also the first Olympics for disabled skiing and, and won some medals and it was, it was really good wow. and it helped publicize it and get it going. Great. So, and we did run at, uh, both at Sunshine through Jerry Johnson. Jerry, who most of you in this room know, Jerry uh, ran a disabled ski program at Sunshine and was really major innovator in Western Canada of disabled skiing and now runs it out of Kimberley. And uh, and we had the same program at Silver Star. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, wonderful. Thank you, John. Uh, that's been great. Um, thank you. And.